So let's go back to talking about our free particles. And in particular, we need to think about momentum eigenstates. So for our bound states, our wells and our standing, that were effectively standing waves, if we think about it in a classical way, we don't have net motion to the left or the right. They're kind of staying in place. So instead, if we have a free particle, it makes much more sense to talk about a free particle that is traveling to the right or a free particle that is traveling to the left. So we don't necessarily want energy eigenstates, we want momentum eigenstates. So that would look like this equation. We take our momentum operator, we're going to apply it to a state, we'll get back a fixed value of the momentum, and then that state. So this would just be the equation defining our momentum eigenstates. Now notice that we're using sub p here to note that this is now it's still an eigenstate, so we're using f um, phi rather than psi, but sub p makes it clear that this is a momentum eigenstate and not an energy eigenstate. Not necessarily. So remember that that operator is given this way. So that hat is really important because these two objects are not the same thing. This is the scalar value of momentum. This is the operator that measures momentum. So if we think about it this way, I'm going to say that I have negative i h bar, and I'm going to bring p over over p, d, mm, I've already messed this up, d phi dx equals phi. Hmm. Right? So notice that in this case we have a scalar value times the derivative equals the function itself. So another way to, to write this, if we rearrange it in the other way, and let me just, you know, go back and basically say, if this was df dx equals, say, a, uh, let me pick, mm, what's a letter we haven't used lately? Let me pick, I don't want to pick anything that's special. Uh, many letters are special, it gets very confusing. Let me pick a Greek letter we haven't used. Okay, that, there's, there's a Greek letter, right? So it has this form, that we've taken a derivative with respect to x, we get a scalar out, times our original function. Well, that clearly is going to have the form then that we have some coefficient out front, e to then this Greek letter, x, right? We take the derivative, that comes down. So now, if we, if we look at this form, we see that this is going to be equal then, we would invert it, so negative p over i h bar, and we can pull that i on the top, think about multiplying the top and the bottom by i, so that would be then i p over h bar, and then the other thing to note is that because you had i squared on the bottom, the negative one goes away. So we can then rewrite this as my wave function, switch markers, my wave function that's a momentum eigenstate as a function of position, remember to keep that coefficient out front. And note that before when we were talking about energy, we had a second order differential, and so I told you, oh, we're going to have two solutions. Here it's a first order, so we actually only have this one solution to worry about. So a e to the i p over h bar x, okay? So this is going to be what our momentum eigenfunctions look like. Now notice that this is e to the i, so we can express this as sines and cosines. It's not necessarily going to be convenient to do so. But remember that when you have a complex exponential, that is actually a sinusoidal function. And now we have this p-value. So that's great. Our momentum has shown up here. So you could go back and check to verify that this, when we pull it in here, will work out. And, and it does, we kind of went forwards, but you can also verify. So one thing to keep in mind is that when we had our energy values, we couldn't really have a negative energy, at least not in what we were talking about. And one of the ways to think through that is that we were normally above our potential, and so whatever our energy value was, was actually equivalent to a kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is never negative. So we will later see some bound energies and we'll define kind of where zero energy is, but so far for the wells, right, if I had a well, we kind of said, okay, that is V equals zero, and so all of the energies we were talking about were above V and were above zero. And even if this was a finite well rather than an infinite well, we still would set this value equal to zero. So all of the energies we've talked about so far 
they have been positive. But now, when we're talking about momentum, momentum can be positive or negative. Negative momentum just means traveling in the opposite direction. So right now, we are still talking about a one-dimensional system, right? So kind of in, in a straight line. So one direction will be of the positive momentum, the other will be negative. So note now that we can have positive or negative values of momentum. The other thing to keep in mind is that where quantization came from, in terms of what are the allowed energies, that was due to boundary conditions here. When we're dealing with the free particle, there are no boundary conditions, and so that means that all of our momentum values are actually valid. We haven't yet encountered anything that says momentum can only be certain values. And in fact, we're not, we're not necessarily going to have that. And this should make sense. If I'm talking about an electron that's traveling towards you, I should be able to have that moment that electron have, say, any speed or any momentum, therefore. So, so that's going to be true. We don't actually have quantized values of momentum for the free particles, but we do want to express our states as momentum eigenstates. So that's our starting point. We're going to do a lot more work with this, but just keep in mind that how we're doing the notation, you probably want to put a subscript on here to remind yourself that these are momentum eigenstates, and notice that these are similar but different from the energy eigenstates we've been talking about so far.